find two big facts about public policy in the last, over the last 60 years in Australia. First big fact was that it was only in the 1960s that competition came to be regarded as a socially beneficial arrangement in Australia. Previously, competition was widely and vigorously suppressed both publicly and privately. Second big fact, following the removal of many restrictions on competition from the 1960s onwards, there has been a vast increase in public regulation of markets and private behaviour generally. And I'll give you uh, some brief explanations of these two big facts through my talk. Public choice theory, which I'll explain later on, has had a considerable impact on the way that economists teach economics. Up until the 1970s, economists taught welfare economics, and uh, uh, we had a big W up here earlier today on one of uh, Paul's slides, welfare economics, as though the rationale of that bit of economics was to give advice to benevolent public decision makers. And public choice uh, changed that way of teaching economics. However, I was argue that public choice theory had a much smaller impact on Australian public policy than it had on the way economics is taught. And I'll illustrate that with respect to the rise of free trade in Australia. In my final section, uh, which will be right on afternoon tea, uh, I'll try to reconcile my two big facts and argue that the arrival of public choice theory in Australia was not unambiguously good for the cause of liberty in Australia. So let me talk about how the bad old days came to an end. But I need to talk about the bad old days first. Suspicion of competition dominated Australian public policy and thinking for the first five or six decades of the 20th century. The national strategy of economic development was surrounded and nurtured by an anti-competitive ethos. Focus of today, competition from imports was to be regretted and controlled by made to measure systems of tariffs, missed by the tariff board. Competition from non European immigrants was restricted through late racist laws. Wage competition amongst Australian employers and workers was regulated. Major enterprises were made public, given monopoly status, and shielded from competition from their private substitutes. For example, the railways were protected uh, by restrictions on trucking. Private oligopolies and monopolies were encouraged. Minor example, Australian Industries Preservation Act 1906 attempted to prevent the takeover of Australian enterprises by foreigners, especially among British ones. And I could go on. Now all of this was based on the belief that it was improved to rely heavily on vigorous private competition to achieve socially desirable outcomes of higher living standards and rapid population growth in Australia. Instead, I'm sorry. <laughs> Instead, competition was typically regarded as a transitional stage leading to the creation of monopolies, either by private action or by nationalisation. Or competition could be properly confined to areas where it wouldn't do much harm. A classic expression of this was found in the 1912 13 High Court's judgment in the appeal of what was called the Coal Bend Case, and I'll quote from the justices. Cutthroat competition is not now regarded by a large portion of mankind as necessarily beneficial to the public. The intention of the parties, that is, the sellers of coal, uh, was to put the Newcastle coal trade on a satisfactory basis, which would enable them to pay adequate wages to their men and sell their coal at a price remunerative to themselves. It changed. The first Australian uh, regular, uh, le legislation against restricted trade practices was passed in Australia in the 1960s. That's half a century after it was passed in the United States, in the Sherman Act. 
I said, before the 1960s and competitor after the 1960s change. I'm going to go through the changes which you've all heard. There was a change in the lead attitudes towards tariffs, which led to lower tariffs, especially uh, after the 1960s and 70s and 80s, and then accelerated at the end of the 80s. The regulation of banking and the exchange rate in the 1980s, the removal of many artificial public monopolies, or at least making those uh, public monopolies or public enterprises to compete on a level playing field with private firms. And it even led the Hawke and Keating governments to some deregulation of the labour markets in the late 1980s and early 1990s. So since I've, I've quoted uh, judges earlier, I'll quote some more. In the uh, uh, High Court case called Queensland Wire, which is famous to my family because my brother, Bill Pinkus, was the judge whose early judgment was overthrown by the High Court. <laughs> Wrong, in my opinion. Uh, <laughs> competition, said the Justice in 1989, by its very nature is deliberate and ruthless. Com competitors jockey for sales, the more effective competitors injuring the less effective by taking sales away. Competitors almost always try to injure each other in some way, but competition has never been a tort. These injuries are the inevitable competition. A consequence of the competition that Section 46 of the Trade Act, Practices Act is designed to foster. Okay. Uh, for the first half of the 20th century, politicians legislated higher and higher rates of protection against imports and a whole range of things I've mentioned. And the second half, they legislated higher rates, uh, lower rates, uh, lower and lower rates, as Peter's uh, excellent charge show of protection. So I'm going to focus on protection. And I'll give my version of what changed and I'll talk about what role public choice play. Now I vividly remember a speech at the Productivity Commission at the time of the 30th anniversary of the foundation of the uh, earlier version of the Productivity Commission, skipped by Peter Costello, uh, the then treasurer. And Peter Costello reminded the audience that it was not economists in government or in universities who made changes in government policy, but politicians. Politicians, he implied, were the real heroes of the tale of the movement towards free trade. Of course, by implication, they were the real villains from the previous uh, episodes. So what explains changes in economic policy? This is where public choice theory comes in. Central aim of public choice economics is to understand how public sector decisions are made, how public decisions are made. More generally, to understand non-market decision making by applying the standard tools of economists and the standard set of assumptions that economists use. So public choice studies the behaviour of people in interest groups, as voters, as politicians and as bureaucrats. That's one, one might say, the positive side of public choice. And then there's a more uh, normative side, or, or uh, uh, well, the more normative side, uh, usually called uh, constitutional political economy, which has to do with devising rules in order to make the good outcomes. Now, this year marks the 50th anniversary of the publication of. James Buchanan in Gordon Tullock's book called The Calculus of Consent, which was the founding document of both traditions in public choice. Uh, time available, I'll present a very simplified version of public choice. Rule one. Don't assume that electoral competition will have the same beneficial effects as market competition. Rule two. Don't assume that policy makers and bureaucrats are benevolent and lack all self-interest. I should say, don't assume that they lack all self-interest. They may be benevolent, but they may have some self-interest too. Frederick Bastiat wrote in the 1850s in French, but I won't speak French. If the natural tendencies of mankind are so bad that it's not safe to permit people to be free, then how is it that the tendencies 
of these organised people are always good. Do not the legislators and their appointed agents also belong to the human race? Or do they believe themselves to be made of finer clay than the rest of mankind? That's questionable. Don't assume uh, uh, that uh, bureaucrats and legislators are made of finer clay. Now, if some selection mechanism meant that all legislators and bureaucrats were angels, then maybe we would rest assured that they would always produce good outcomes of personal well-being. James Madison, the father, along with the father's US Constitution, argued against making rules and laws for a society of angels. Rules should be designed so that we have decent outcomes, even if public players are merely ordinary people, ordinary players. David Hume, who uh, was mentioned uh, <coughs> whatever that fellow's name is, David, uh, died in 1776. Uh, year of remarkable events. He went further. It is not, is it therefore, sorry, it is therefore a just political maxim that every man should be supposed a knave. This is the kind of minimax strategy. Is that Madison said, let's not assume they're angels. Hume before him said, let's assume they're knaves and set up our rules to make sure that there's a kind of minimax strategy using constitutional constraints on the power of government uh, to prevent very bad outcomes. A public choice economist argued that even if we assume that the motivations of individuals in the public sphere of life are exactly the same as those of individuals in the private sphere, then political processes would not necessarily protect against good outcomes, and certainly not to the extent that markets do. Electoral competition doesn't necessarily have the beneficial effect of market competition. When it comes to tariff cuts, any benevolent and disinterested person will not only consider the overall national benefit, but also where and on whom the benefits and costs will fall. As the saying goes, all politics is local, and it is the case that reducing government taxes on imports will cause harm to some firms, to some industries, some regions, will benefit other firms, regions and industries. Public choice argues, because of the nature of electoral politics, the losers will be much more influential politically than the gainers. This means that tariffs were imposed, as they were in Australia, even when, arguably, the total losses exceeded the total gains and national welfare suffered. Now, my own, early, my own work on early American tariffs was greatly influenced by uh, a book written in 1935, Elmer Snatch, book called Politics, Precious and the Tariff. But in the later book, called The Steady Soul of the People, he wrote, the notion that the pressure system, by which he means the system of government in which pressure groups operate, is automatically representative of the community as a whole, that notion is a myth. The system that instead is skewed, loaded and unbalanced in favour of a fraction of the minority. Well, these days, the fraction of the minority has its own special name. The Chatsnyder's approach became one element of public choice from the 1960s on with was the work of Nancy Olson Jr., who Max would have known quite well, and uh, George Stick of the University of Chicago. And we've heard the, the ideas, they're sort of simple minded. Relatively small groups with much at stake, more active and effective politically than a large, diffused collection of people, each with little to gain uh, or to lose. And politicians, regulators, and bureaucrats react uh, correspondingly. Well, with that sort of idea, you can start explaining why Australia had something like the pattern of tariffs that it had, with high protection for footwear, clothing, textiles, motor vehicles, etc. But I believe it's pretty pessimistic about the opportunities of jettisoning uh, that uh, tariff system. So, what changed? Uh, two things changed ideas and facts. Didn't print out page 12, so I have to remember it. 
And Max uh, Corden is on page, page 12. Sorry, Max. Max, <laughs> Max, Max won't be embarrassed if I say that Max helped understand the, the revolution in ideas about uh, protection in Australia, better understanding of its pattern. And particularly, Max were very helpful in understanding the implications of the complicated system of uh, requirements for manufacturers to have a certain Australian content and also the system of giving free of tariff imports for those manufacturers who uh, exported uh, uh, products in addition. Uh, the other thing that uh, I'm going to explain is that facts and knowledge of facts change. Some of these facts were uh, about tariffs were pushed uh, hard by the modest men that for the weight of Billy Kelly uh, and John Hyde and others and a number of economic journalists who effectively made the case against tariff protection. So, I'm going to say ideas change and knowledge of facts change and facts change. One of the facts that changed was it became obvious that tariff protection was much more damaging to Australia than possibly it had been in the past. Uh, for me, an amazing event was a Minister of the Crown who was, who was caught smuggling in uh, a television set in Australia because it's so much cheaper of all. And he didn't know that it wasn't bad to do that. <laughs> <laughs> it was also significant uh, was the role of economists within the bureaucracy as a, and advisors to the bureaucracy, especially agricultural economists who experienced the quantitative economics. Economic theory rarely wins political argument in single-handed combat. The new weapon in the good fight was numerical modelling, which has been mentioned before, which made it easier for the advocates of protection uh, to persuade political elites in Australia to start doing something about it. Numerical models were uh, developed with the assistance of the Tariff Board, and they've been mentioned earlier, Rani, etc., uh, and the Productivity Commission still helps on it. Models began small, but bigger and bigger, and they attempt to now to capture characteristics of hundreds of separate industries uh, and work out if you change some of the, some of the uh, controlling variables, what happens to the economy as a whole. Now, hanging in the room where I used to meet once a month with the Productivity Commissioners when I worked for them was a poster from 1967 from the Australian newspaper, 2017. 4th of September, said tariffs cost $2,700 million a year. You don't know what that means. 7.5% of the Australian GDP. A big number. Undoubtedly, quantitative evidence of this kind helped change opinions. Now, was it really chance or bias on the part of the models that they came up with the public benefit of the cutting charts. Actually, it's intrinsic in these sorts of models. It, these models grew in a sense on brilliant theoretical work in general group written, our own group, which showed how decentralised decision making, basically competitive markets, could drive the economy to a point from which it was impossible to make somebody better off without making somebody worse off, a famous Pareto criteria. Numerical models have the same feature, set them running, they'll compute an equilibrium for which it's impossible to make anybody better off without changing something outside the model. In this story, competition plays a central part. If right conditions exist, competitive the micro competition will bring about the best of all possible worlds. So, if you change the constraints put into the model, the models will generate a different equilibrium, change the input tariffs, models will show some people work made better off, some people made worse off, but uh, typically the models show that there is an overall gain that was captured in that, uh, that newspaper. 
uh, headlines. Now, the large size of the prize, 7.5% of GDP, plus something which I haven't mentioned, I just mentioned in passing, a better understanding of how labour markets work in Australia, uh, were used by economists to support the arguments that it was the national interest to cut uh, protection. Now, I explained earlier that public choice economics, at least one aspect of it, says how small groups that are substantially affected can be more influential than larger groups that aren't so affected uh, uh, per head as much. One would expect then that public choice economists would have been very strongly in favour of compensating the losing groups in order to get them out of the way to get the policy. Surprisingly, public choice antagonism to pressure groups and interest groups so large that nearly all of them uh, argued against adjustment assistance of this kind. I can remember standing in the room and arguing favour and having Anne Kruger shout at me about it because it was such a horrible thing to do. In the event, the Balkan Keating governments did reduce the resistance to tariff cuts through things like the prevention, the button plan. Uh, uh, easing the transition of groups which uh, had the damage. Earlier I said there were two big facts. Competition used to be regarded as damaging and then from the 60s on which was regarded as beneficial. Uh, secondly, that there were company, accompanying the reduction in the barriers to competition the vast increases in regulation. I'll try to link this to yeah. Earlier I argued that economic modelling gave theoretical as well as numerical support to the idea that this would produce tariffs, especially high ones. But the same sort of modelling gave very strong support to a vast range of government regulations for private economic activities. Our own the Bruce models decentralised competitive markets so you could produce through competition the best of all possible worlds. But their version of competition was very different from the ruthless competitive process that the justices of the Queensland Wire has in mind. Their story and the story in these models in general, and Rob Ties is here and he falls outside of this criticism, um, are not stories about entry and exit and rivalry, but are, are stories of each agent inside the model having a vanishingly small presence in markets of homogenous products that already exist or for which perfectly functioning contingent markets already exist. You couldn't buy an iPhone before the 29th of June 2007, but in the Arrow of the Brew world, you could buy an option on one any time you like. Seen in this perspective, the models have little to do with real flesh and blood competition. They're the social planners' version of competition. Now these um, theories about the benefits of competition that are of very kind came along with a long list of requirements, including markets where we conceivable commodity, constant returns to scale, no pollution, a whole range, long, long list. Well, it's obvious these conditions don't universally uh, exist, and so they grew up a veritable industry of discovering market failures and then reported cures. A bit of tinkering here and a bit of tinkering there, creation of a new public monopoly here or there, and we're now on the best, on our way to the best of all possible worlds. When I went to work for the Productivity Commission in 2002, I remarked that it was Australia's up-to-date central plan. The Commission was continuing with its old function of suggesting to governments some welfare enhancing changes in public subsidies or taxes like tariffs. The Commission would never plan prices or quantities. It didn't act like a pre long term plan. Rather, it gave advice to government to rely on decentralised behaviour to find the best for the economy that the newly improved economic environment would offer. But the Commission had some new functions playing novel and improved markets and quasi-market mechanisms. Example, Report 05 of 2008. 
If consumer markets fail to give consumers sufficient guarantee about the quality of what they're buying, then a whole new regime of consumer protection is required, supported by a general equilibrium model. If the gambling industry fails to protect vulnerable problem gamblers, then new legislation on pre commitment should be considered in the court post 6 2010. If the markets for executive fail to generate optimum contracts, then a new rule about three strikes should be legislated. And of course, the big one if carbon dioxide is a pollutant and it's not priced, then the price of the market should be set up for trading and permits. Now, this is quite a different function than attempting to correct failures of government policy like high tariffs. It involves attempts to improve on the outcomes of decentralized markets. The main theoretical criticism of such efforts used to be called the theory of the second best, which was if you fiddle with the economy here and there are other problems in the economy, this fiddling may make things worse when you think it's going to make it better. Well, the big computable general equilibrium models actually dealt with that problem because they were able to incorporate a whole series of uh, distortions in the economy, get rid of one distortion, and it will tell you the answer whether it's a good thing or a bad thing. Public Choice School of Economics provided a second criticism for this program of correcting alleged market failure, which is captured in the term of government failure. Uh, I'll be a bit brief because afternoon tea is uh, coming on. Um, but this, this form of thinking has a history going back centuries, but certainly uh, in the United States from the first decade of the last century of Bentley's work. Uh, but I'm going to pick up on some new left historians, Gabriel Kolko, who discussed how the progressive era in the United States led to regulation, things like the railroad trusts, but that regulation ended up in the hands of ex-businessmen uh, who ran the regulators for the benefit of the regulator. And uh, this form, quasi-Marxist idea, became a very standard fair for people uh, who didn't like uh, private activity of this kind. So the AMA, the Australian Medical Association, which by the way started in the 1820s when we had to get uh, uh, certified people who could talk at coronial inquiries, uh, the AMA was merely a bunch of self-interested types who band together to engage in conspiracy against the public interest. And so on and Though these groups claim to pursue public good, in reality, they are inefficiently distributing wealth towards themselves by the government. Now, the unintended effect of this attack on the interest group was to help reduce the power and prestige of private groups and increase the power of government. So, doctors, lawyers, credit suppliers, real estate agents, every conceivable occupation can be regulated by government and not by self-regulation had some standing in law. Now, for a lover of individual liberty, this outcome is a small disaster. The efforts of public choice economists uh, encourage the decline of prestige social standing of groups intermediate between the individual and the state. The, the <coughs> groups intermediate between the individual and the state lost the one of standing. The vacuum was more than filled by the new mandarins, all employees of the state, vested with great power and resources. I conclude, liberty depends on the diffusion of power and is threatened by a concentration of power. Concentra a constitution that separates power, like the American, some for the executive, the legislature, the judiciary, is not sufficient for liberty. Topful remarked about this about the United States when he remarked, uh, talked about the power of local groups and limiting the power of the centre of government. These days we use the term civil society instead of local group as a grip that slows the wheels of the state. Chris Berg wrote in The Drunk earlier this year, the untold story of neoliberal reforms of the last few decades is how privatisation and trade regulation was matched by an extraordinary explosion of new regulation, 
to enforce this huge corpus of new law and regulations, state power spun off into dozens of independent bodies. The responsibility of regulation was moved under ministries and into agencies. My amendment is to say the first step was the responsibility for regulation was stripped completely from the private sector, virtually taken over by government, and then the scope and detail of regulation expanded vastly as the cost of regulation no longer fell in any way upon the regulators. So I'll finish with the gloss on Henry Ergas's blog of March 5th this year. The essence of democracy is open expression and testing of competing interests. Montesquieu saw as the supreme benefit of a free commercial society that competing and independent interests place passion in the affairs of replace passion in the affairs of the state, interest replaced passion. Only then can the great and sudden arbitrary actions of the sovereign be prevented. Topfield also warned of the danger that democracy faced that it was precisely when men of substance, we say men and women of substance these days, which shun involvement in the public affairs for the sake of pursuing their own private fortunes, leaving the running of the state to hapless mediocrities, not mediocrities, but having little better to do but seek to perpetuate their rule. Uh, top for you, too. Thank you very much.